Thank you. Can you all hear me? I've, I've got three or four microphones. It's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, tonight. I don't know um, if any of you know, but uh, today in, in the United States is Thanksgiving. Uh, so if uh, we were back home, we would just be finishing up a big turkey dinner and sitting, settling down to watch uh, innumerable football games that don't matter. So it's uh, much more fun to be here. It's also um, fun to see uh, so many old friends. My wife and I were here on sabbatical in London um, uh, 10 years ago, and I remember we rented a place up a little uh, off the Chalk Farm tube station. It was former council housing. I think it was about 50 square meters. Um, and at the time, I remember that we, it was awfully expensive. It was going for about, uh, I think it was about a thousand pounds a month, and uh, which seemed to us to be uh, awfully expensive, much more than it would uh, our mortgage was in California. And I imagine it's probably two or three thousand pounds uh, today. So that part is uh, is uh, interesting. I'm going to be talking uh, today about tracking and explaining neighborhood socioeconomic change in U.S. metropolitan areas between 1990 and 2010. Um, with special attention to gentrification. And I, I certainly realize that coming to London to talk about gentrification from America is really a little like uh, the proverbial bringing coals to Newcastle. Um, you folks have uh, much more experience with neighborhood change uh, and gentrification than we do um, in the United States as a whole. I suppose New York and London are on par. But nonetheless, um, we have about 360 metropolitan areas uh, in the United States. Uh, I don't know how many, uh, I know you don't call them metropolitan areas here in the UK, um, uh, but so we have ample opportunity to see how neighborhood change occurs across many, many, many diverse different types of areas and why it does occur some places, why it doesn't occur uh, other places, and that gives us an, an opportunity to, to really study it in, in great detail. Um, I'm going to be talking about neighborhood change generally, in particular socioeconomic change, but I am going to talk, come back and, and talk again about gentrification uh, now and then. So um, I went online uh, this afternoon and, and, and just typed uh, uh, Gentrification UK and got this wonderful um, uh, graphic from uh, The Guardian. Uh, of it's, it's, you know, it's an ongoing phenomenon and it seems to be a, a broadening phenomenon, gentrification, neighborhood change. Uh, across the U.S. and I think the Guardian, by the by the way, has done a marvelous job in documenting the changes that are occurring in cities. Uh, and of course, it's not just the U.K. Let's see where that goes. Um, let's see how can there we go. Um, this these are uh, new headlines from the United States. Uh, um, uh, San, there's sort of two sort of ground zeros in the United States for issues of neighborhood change and gentrification. One is San Francisco. That image on the upper right, by the way, is the infamous Google bus um, by which all the members of the creative class, creative class who live in San Francisco board the Google bus and take it every day down to Silicon Valley and then come back. And it's been um, the scene of many, many uh, protests. Uh, and it seems like uh, gentrification, whether it emerged out of New York or San Francisco, is taking over. Um, here's an image on the lower um, lower left, uh, Oakland, Brooklyn by the Bay. Oakland, a sort of historical working class area uh, in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area has now become the Brooklyn of the Bay Area. Um, and uh, even the South Bronx, which uh, when I started uh, uh, teaching uh, in the uh, early 80s was regarded as sort of the no man's land in New York uh, that, that was going to be, uh, suffer for bl from blight forever. Uh, people are now, this was a recent, uh, not too long ago, article from the New York Times, uh, gentrification and neighborhood change, or even taking over the South Bronx, which nobody thought um, would ever come back. Uh, in fact, you know, this idea of, of gentrification and concern about uh, gentrification is relatively recent. Um, a generation ago, we were much more worried about blight in cities, uh, disinvestment in cities, and investment was seen as the cure for um, blight and the cure from rundown cities. And so there's sort of a 50-year-old, a 50-year timeline for the city of New York. Um, back in, in the 1970s, people, um, New York City literally went bankrupt for a few days and they appealed uh, to uh, the federal government uh, for financial help and the president of the federal government, federal fe president of the US at the time, Gerald Ford, in a very famous uh, uh, front page article uh, in the New York Post, was reputed, turned down that request for federal aid. So the, the headline was, Ford to New York City, 
drop dead. Sort of the nadir of New York City was in the late 1970s, uh, and, uh, um, but then a bunch of things happened, uh, some of them spurred on by good planning and good urban redevelopment. In 1990, New York City's crime rate declined for the first time. Uh, in uh, 2000, around, right around 2000, um, there was rising minority home ownership in New York City. Home ownership had fallen in New York City. Uh, for the first time, and, and really by the, uh, in the last five or six years, the headlines uh, never really talk about blight in New York City. They all um, talk about uh, gentrification. Let's see if we can get the next slide. Um, there's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful uh, presentation on the history of gentrification. I'm very much aware that uh, gentrification is an idea that's 50 years old, it started here in London by Ruth Glass. Uh, my wife and I tried to walk through Islington today to sort of get to the original ground zero. We didn't quite um, make it, uh, but there's a wonderful uh, sort of timeline with an American focus on the history of gentrification. Let's see if this comes up. It's a little slow. Um, that talks about, well, I don't, I don't think it's going to come up right now, uh, but if you would get a chance, um, okay, well, there it is. If you get a chance, this is a very nice sort of review. Um, so just a, a wonderful timeline on uh, 50 years of gentrification, and, and of course, here is, well, it's still. Now, there, there it is. There is the picture of Ruth, Ruth Glass talking about this idea of uh, in, investment. And it's not so much investments, but it's a change in the character of the neighborhood, uh, a change uh, in uh, the people who are uh, in the neighborhood. And then um, has, it's a wonderful timeline of, of, uh, with a U.S. bias, of course. So I'm going to do um, uh, a bunch of things today. I'm going to start by asking four questions about neighborhood change. And again, I, I'm in a context where I have a about 360 different metropolitan areas, and I want to look at commonalities in a neighborhood change across that. So uh, I'm going to start by asking four questions. I'm going to proceed to this idea of sort of measuring how neighborhood change uh, happens, and I'm going to measure it over the period between 1990 and 2010 in the US among the 70 largest metropolitan areas, and I'm going to use a method I call the 3D method the double decile decline. That's the three Ds, double decile decline, which I think is a, provides a robust way for thinking about measuring neighborhood change. I'll introduce gentrification as a special case of that measurement of neighborhood change. And then we're going to sort of say, well, when we get neighborhood change, does it happen because of macro forces that are happening at the national or the regional or metropolitan level, sort of the idea of a rising regional tide lifting neighborhood boats, or does it happen because of the actions of individual actors taken at the local or neighborhood level, or is it, what's the combination of macro forces and micro enterprise that sort of produces this phenomena of neighborhood change? So I'll get to those two issues, and we've got a few statistical models of that. Uh, and then I'm going to get to the sort of crucial issue. There's an assumption here, at least in the United States, and I think probably in the UK as well, um, that any time you get a substantial investment, uh, substantial income, substantial money flowing into a new neighborhood, that it automatically drives out the old residents. And in many ways, that represents a social cost. Uh, and we measure that by something we call displacement, the involuntary out migration or out movement of the original population. Uh, and so we'll look at whether there's an association, once we've sort of measured and defined gentrification, we'll look at whether to see whether there is an association between um, uh, turnover displacement and gentrification. And then we'll come back to some, I think, some important implications for American planners. And I think it'll be interesting to see if, if we would draw the same in implications uh, here in the UK. So here are the four questions. Um, this, uh, let's see, let's go back. Um, I think this, uh, this uh, pre okay, it wants me to ask the first one. Um, this presentation probably works best on the Jewish holiday of Passover where they're asking four questions anyway, but I'll ask a very different four questions. Uh, is it possible to come up with a robust, robust approach to measuring gentrification and other types of neighborhood socioeconomic change across all U.S. metropolitan areas? Most of the literature on gentrification, at least in the United States, uh, focuses on a few cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, if, it's a, if it's a true national phenomenon, we should be able to measure it at the national level, and that's what we're going to try and do. Uh, to what degree are gentrification, other forms of substantial neighborhood socioeconomic change, the result of metropolitan scale economic and demographic forces versus more bottom-up and neighborhood specific forces and dynamics. So you hear a lot these days about the creative class powering metropolitan economies. 
Um, to what extent is the rise of the creative class in America, the rise of millennials at the metropolitan scale driving this gentrification phenomenon at the neighborhood level? Or, as question three asks, to what degree is it under the control, under the power, under the initiative of individual households, individual property owners, developers, and speculators? Uh, there's a large literature that talks about gentrification and neighborhood change as the result of intentional speculation. Uh, what does the evidence say about that? And then finally come to this issue of um, to what extent are gentrification always accompanied by the displacement of existing residents. Um, gentrification is accompanied by turnover and displacement, but is it always accompanied by it? Is it part and parcel of the idea of neighborhood change? So let's see. Okay, so here's the first question. Uh, and here I'm going to use this method that I call the 3D or double decile difference method. Uh, and bear with me for a second. So the idea here is we want to look at um, uh, we want to look at change at the neighborhood level, socioeconomic change at the neighborhood level. So we're going to start with uh, let's say in, we're going to look between 1990 and 2010, and my analysis does end in 2010. And if we look at Tract 101, uh, and if we were to divide the income distribution uh, in our metropolitan area, which everyone we're looking at, into deciles, and uh, decile one is the lowest, decile ten is the highest, uh, the darkest shade. Uh, and so let's say we have tract 101 and that falls in the third decile in 1990 with a, a median income in that tract. In America all the, the whole country is divided into census tracts and um, the typical metropolitan area has somewhere between 200 and 2,000 census tracts. So if we were to look at tract 101 and it started with a, uh, an income of 17,000, uh, if we came back in the year 2010, that same tract had an income of 42,000. There's been an absolute increase um, of, in income. And this is before correcting for inflation or the cost of living. Um, but you can see that um, this is what I would call um, substantial uh, neighborhood socioeconomic change or upgrading. But as you can see, tract 101 has jumped from being located in the third decile of that metropolitan area uh, to the fifth decile. So relative to its metropolitan area, um, I'm not asking relative to itself or relative to the country, I'm saying relative to its own metropolitan area, it hasn't changed metropolitan areas, you can see that tract 101 has moved up by two decile classes. And I'm going to define substantial neighborhood upgrading as an upward movement of two or more decile classes relative to the original metropolitan area. So I'm not going to compare income levels across metropolitan areas. I'm going to compare income changes within metropolitan areas. And that allows us to look at decline as well. Um, substantial neighborhood socioeconomic decline represents a two or more decile decrease. That's why we call it the double decile difference method. A two or more decile decrease uh, in income. So census tract 110 started out in 1990 with a $45,000 median income, ended up in 2010 with a $42,000 median income. Again, same, same income, um, uh, census tract 101 and census tract 110 have the same income in 2010, but you can see from this graphic and from the definition that census tr tract 101 has, a, is, has experienced upgrading while, while census tract 110 has experienced decline. Now this, this method, this 3D method, has a variety of advantages. It's pretty easy to do. Um, we can automate it. Uh, and at least in America, and I assume here in the UK, that census uh, track data is readily available. It's pretty reliable. And again, because we're looking uh, within metropolitan areas, it's pretty easy um, to operationalize. Uh, the use of income deciles is convenient and robust. Uh, it avoids having to track housing occupancy and occupancy change. So we're just looking at what's happening at the neighborhood level. We're not having to look at uh, whether there's been an, a change in the housing stock, a change in housing tenure. I'll come back to that. Uh, and we're not having to look at how many, what the uh, change in occupancy is in the housing stock. Who's moving in, who's moving out. We're just looking at it, an aggregate at, at the neighborhood level. By the way, in America, the typical census tract has about four to 5,000 people in it. So that's sort of the spatial scale or the numerical scale. Um, that we're looking at. Uh, and the use of a, a two or more deciles, a change across two or more deciles, uh, distinguishes big change from small changes. 
You can imagine many situations in which uh, a, a tract has experienced a, a small change in income that would have moved it from the seventh to the eighth decile, and we don't want to count that. That might be significant, it might be important, it might be predictive, but it's not the same as measuring a two or more decile change. Now, this method has a, a bunch of disadvantages, too. It obviously lacks um, subtlety. Uh, when we think about gentrification in, in America, and I think here in the UK, we're really looking at, at a combination of three sets of changes. Uh, we're looking at a change in income, uh, which is what I'm looking at here. We're typically looking at investment in the housing stock, so a change in the nature of the housing stock. And lastly, we're looking at some level of turnover in the population, uh, involuntary or voluntary turnover, and we're more concerned with involuntary, involuntary turnover. I'm only looking at the first. I'm lo only looking at a, a change in the socioeconomic status of the neighborhood. I'm not looking at changes in the housing stock or changes in turnover, although, uh, I, as I said, I will come back to this issue of turnover. This method doesn't consider income starting points, um, and uh, the use of deciles to keep track of relative income, uh, incomes, not poverty or of wealth, is an incomplete measure. So, for example, if incomes in every tract were to grow or decline by $20,000, all the tracts would be materially wealthy, but since they all gained a $20,000 growth in income, there wouldn't be any change in their relative position. I would record them, I would record no neighborhood change in that case, where, where clearly there has been some level, level of neighborhood change. So th there's some advantages of, to this method, but there are also some clear disadvantages as well. So where does gentrification come in? It, it's going to come in by, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, gentrification is simply neighborhood upgrading starting at a relatively low income. Um, in the United States, um, the, um, the uh, trigger point for uh, government housing assistance is typically 80% of area median income. That means if you're, if you're a household and you get uh, 80, and your income is 80% or less, um, then you might be eligible for certain forms of government housing assistance. Uh, housing assistance in America is not an entitlement. It doesn't mean you're going to be eligible for it. In the United States, again, only about one out of every three households who are eligible actually receive uh, housing assistance. Um, but nonetheless, we have the standard that says that about 80% of area median income uh, would, in, would make you eligible. So I'm going to use the, about that standard, which corresponds um, to the, about the fourth decile and say if you started, if your neighborhood started in the fourth decile or below, you could start in the first, second, third, or fourth, and uh, 20 years later you were in a decile that was two or more higher, I'm going to call that gentrification. So gentrification is, an up, is, is socioeconomic upgrading starting at much, quite a bit below um, the median. And again, that misses out issues of turnover, issues of displacement, issues of investment or disinvestment in the housing stock. It's simply looking at the socioeconomic status of um, the neighborhood. I'm also going to differentiate core area tracks and suburban tracks, because I'm interested to know whether this phenomena is happening in the suburbs and these phenomena is, well, we observe that they're happening in our central cities. But in America, uh, in the United States, central cities come in all shapes and forms. So instead of um, tabulating just what's happening in central cities, and uh, I don't even know, coming from America, how I would calculate the central city for London. Would it be the entire London conurbation? Would it be a core area of London? Uh, would it be just the city? It's, it's hard to figure that out. We have some of the same problems in America. So I'm going to distinguish between core areas and suburbs. Core areas are tracks located 10 or more kilometers from the central business district or downtown city hall. Suburban tracks are simply tracks located um, uh, more than 10 kilometers. Now, in a city like Phoenix, um, uh, that would mean that there are many suburban tracks that are in the city. C Phoenix has a very large footprint. In a city like Boston, which has a very small footprint as a city, as a, as a central city, um, some of the core area tracks might actually be outside of Boston. So we're going to try and be consistent. Um, there are some exceptions to this, and I, I, I locate there. So let's look at um, now, doing this uh, takes a little bit of uh, work in GIS, and let me just uh, um, tell you how we did that. Um, it turns out that between 1990 and 2000, about 20% of the American census tracts experienced a boundary change. So uh, in keeping track of census tracts, we have to uh, uh, allow for the fact that some census tracts were combined, many more were split, the boundaries changed. So how do we keep track of these things uh, across uh, 20 years when their boundaries are changing? And it 
Um, thankfully, with GIS, we can do something very, uh, very simple, very straightforward, very robust. So we can take, this is, the San, this is San Francisco here. Uh, this is the city of San Francisco. If any of you have been to San Francisco, this is Marin County. They like to make fun of each other. Um, so we take the uh, deciles, in this case, um, dark, uh, the dark shading indicates a high decile, the light shading indicates a low decile. We rasterize it into a series of grid cells, in this case it's a 100 meter grid cell, and we do that for 1990, and then down below we do it for 2010. So here you can see the rasterized income deciles by census tract in 1990, by 2010. We then subtract one from the other. Um, over here, and so here you can see, again, in dark, a two or more decile decline. In the lighter gray, a two or more decile increase. Uh, and then we take these 100 meter grid cells and we can pour them back into the original census tracts or aggregate them back into the original census tracts or aggregate them into the later census tracts. But either way, we get a pretty consistent measure of uh, socioeconomic change uh, in an urban geography that has changed uh, quite a bit. And this works out pretty well. And here are three um, uh, places. You may not be able to see this. Uh, is it possible to turn the lights down in, in the front? Um, uh, so the image on uh, your left is uh, uh, central Boston. And the uh, 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 tracks in green are the gentrifying tracks. These are, thank you, Nick. These are the, the tracks in green uh, in the image on the left are the tracks that ex oh. Technology doesn't seem to be my friend today. Um, well, I'll just hold this. No, I'm not going to do that. The uh, tracks in green are the tracks that experienced uh, upward socioeconomic change uh, in, in Boston. Here's the CBD of Boston. Here's Government Center in Boston. And the tracks in red are those that experienced uh, substantial neighborhood decline. Uh, again, our image of, uh, of gentrification is it's mostly centered around the core, and you can see that happens, but there's also decline that happens. Again, a two or more decile downward movement. And there's also gentrification that happens in suburban areas. This is suburban gentrification out here. Here's San Francisco. Um, again, here's, here's the map of San Francisco. Here's the CBD, or the Financial District of San Francisco. You can see a lot of gentrification happening throughout that area, but there's also decline happening in certain areas. And then finally, here's a Seattle, another uh, city. Here's the center of Seattle. Um, and you can see here are the residential areas that exper have experienced substantial neighborhood upgrading, but some that have experienced um, substantial uh, neighborhood decline using this measure. So it's not all of a piece. There's decline amidst uh, upgrading. There's upgrading amidst decline. Sometimes it happens in the core areas. Uh, sometimes it happens in suburban areas. So if we total it up, and we say, and we try to get a picture of how pervasive these phenomena are. Uh, the chart on the left shows you the share of the metropolitan ex uh, population uh, that experienced uh, each of these phenomena. Upgrading, gentrification, and decline. Gentrification is a subset of upgrading. So, between so in 1990, about 2.3%, 2.3% of the population of the 70 largest metropolitan areas in America lived in neighborhoods that over the next 20 years would experience substantial upgrading. Only 1.4% of the population lived in neighborhoods that would experience substantial gentrification, but 3.8% of the population lived in neighborhoods that would experience substantial decline. Now I should point out, because I'm measuring um, uh, these changes between 1990 and 2010, I'm getting the effects of the financial crisis. There were many places in which people lost their homes, you saw foreclosures, people were displaced. So we're seeing the uh, early effects of the financial uh, crisis, and that's showing up in many instances as decline. That's what's driving the decline. Um, the financial crisis in many places. So overall, um, in the core area, about uh, two to three percent were li of people uh, lived in neighborhoods that would subsequently upgrade. About four percent lived in neighborhoods that would subsequent subsequently decline. Um, going to the bottom part of the graphic, about three point eight percent, four percent were members of suburban neighborhoods, were residents of suburban neighborhoods that would see upgrading, and about sixteen percent were residents of suburban neighborhoods that would see decline. Now remember, this is socioeconomic decline. It's not necessarily disinvestment in housing, although it could be. Uh, and again, that 15.8% uh, 
were um, largely people who were affected, who lost their homes or had to move out because of uh, the financial crisis. So um, the process or the phenomena of upgrading and decline are not limited to core areas, not limited to center cities. At least in America, they're also happening. In, in fact, their, their magnitude is actually greater in suburban areas. Uh, than in core cities. Now, if we look at the, char the income characteristics of those neighborhoods, so this, is, this, is, this finding is a little more expected. Um, the core, uh, these are all uh, dollar figures over here on the right. In 1990 median income, it hasn't been brought forward to 2010 or 2015 median income. So in general, the incomes of those neighborhoods that would upgrade was about $25,000 US, $26,000 in 1990. The neighborhoods that would gentrify were, had lower incomes. So again, uh, these neighborhoods are starting out from a lower, lower starting point. They're quite a bit poor. These are the neighborhoods that are going to come up. Um, the declining neighborhoods started out quite a bit higher in terms of incomes. Uh, again, not really surprising, but quite a bit higher. So the declining neighborhoods had a fall in incomes. The, uh, court, the upgrading uh, neighborhoods had an, uh, an increase. Same in the suburbs where the um, uh, upgrading income started out at about $30,000. The gentrifying neighborhoods again started out poor uh, and the declining neighborhoods started out much richer. Now these are averages on general. Let's take a look and see how that shakes out in different metropolitan areas. So again, um, if, if you were to say how pervasive was this phenomenon as of 2010, again about uh, uh, if you look at the core, uh, if you look at uh, metropolitan populations in the United States, about 2.3% um, of the metropolitan population lived in a core area that would gentrify, about 4% lived in a core area that would decline, uh, about 4% lived in a suburban area that would be upgraded, about 16% lived in a core area that would decline. This is certainly not the, the, the uh, uh, position that the American media presents. The American media presents a, a picture of pervasive upgrading and pervasive decline, specifically located in central cities. Um, again, the American media is, uh, f is uh, 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 focused in New York City, San, San Francisco, the internet media, and things like that. So they're telling the story that they're familiar with, but the story is much different in different places. So let's look at, by percentages, the top cities by percentage, so this is the percent of the 1990 residents that lived in an area that would be upgraded over the next 20 years by 2010. Uh, and the top city in terms of core area upgrading um, is a Seattle. That's not too unexpected. Seattle is a well known for um, its high tech economy. High tech economy in many instances is driving uh, some of this. But under Seattle, so Seattle had the highest percentage of core, highest um, percentage of uh, urban residents living in core area neighborhoods that would be upgraded. But after Seattle, we get places that people don't necessarily think about as gentrifying. Columbia, South Carolina, which I've never, I think I've been to most metropolitan areas, but I don't think I've ever been to Columbia. Uh, Tampa, Chicago, Portland. The, uh, San Francisco is, is number six on the list. Uh, New York City doesn't even make the list. Atlanta, Stockton, California, uh, Los Angeles. These are places that are experiencing upgrading in terms of a percentage of their population. What about the um, suburban tracts? Again, uh, typically smaller places uh, that uh, people don't uh, talk about. This is suburban upgrading uh, um, and uh, Bakersfield, McAllen. Bakersfield is in California. McAllen is in Texas. Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, Dayton, Ohio, Syracuse, New York, Minneapolis. So these changes are rather pervasive across um, a metropolitan area, and many of the leaders are not the places that you would expect, at least in America. Um, here's the gentrification story. Remember, gentrification is the same thing as upgrading. It starts from a lower point. Uh, the, there's uh, Columbia, South Carolina again, Tampa, Seattle's number three, uh, Stockton, Chicago, uh, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. now make the list. Uh, the gentrifying suburban areas, again, Bakersfield, McAllen, some places we normally don't think about uh, as experience in neighborhood change. And now let's look at decline. Now Las Vegas is a special case because this was sort of ground zero for the effects of the financial crisis um, in, in America uh, in the second part of my study period between uh, 2000 and 2010. Uh, so you do see a number of areas declining due to the financial crisis. Uh, good examples are Las Vegas, Charlotte, Jacksonville, those experienced, a lot of their decline is coming from 
uh, uh, foreclosures in the housing market. But a lot of these other places are experiencing core area decline. And again, you can see those bars are quite a bit bigger than the upgrading bars were. Uh, and then if we look at the suburban tracks, same thing. There are many, uh, in Las Vegas, 60% of the population in 1990 lived in neighborhoods that would experience substantial uh, neighborhood uh, decline. So neighborhood ch change is endemic in America. It's a very fluid society. It's constantly changing, both, both upgrading and decline. At least in the last 10 years, the American media has been telling a story that's primarily about upgrading, and it's primarily been telling a story about gentrification, which is a very selective form uh, of upgrading. So let's get to my second question. To what extent are some of these changes occurring because of top-down forces that are driving macroeconomic, particularly macroeconomic sectoral forces that are driving changes at the metropolitan area? Macroeconomic sectoral forces and macroeconomic Econo macroeconomic demographic forces. So we're going to run a regression model, and the dependent variable in that regression model is going to, are going to be these percentages, the percentages of the urban area population that lived in these neighborhoods that were going to be upgraded, were going to gentrify, or were going to decline. The, the dependent variable in these regression models are going to be those percentages, and the independent variables are going to be the characteristics of the metropolitan areas. So again, I have 70 metropolitan areas. So I'm going to have 70 observations, more or less, on my regression. So we're going to run regressions in which the unit of analysis is the metropolitan area. And we're going to look at things like, did bigger, was there more change in bigger metropolitan areas? Well, we would expect that to be the case. Was there more change in which the population was changing faster, growing faster? We would expect that to be the case. Was there more change in places where incomes were moving up or down as a, at a metropolitan level? We might expect that to be the case. Was there more change when housing prices, this is the Federal Housing Finance Agency Housing Price Index, um, something they do for every metropolitan area, uh, and it measures, it accurately measures changes in housing prices over time and uh, across the country. Um, what about ha uh, uh, how, uh, metropolitan areas with older houses, houses built prior to 1950? Uh, what about metropolitan areas in which the po population was typically white versus minority? What about, um, we hear a lot that gentrification is driven, or excuse me, neighborhood change, upgrading is being driven by the high rates of migration. Um, many people moving from uh, Latin America, but also ma many people moving from uh, Asia to U.S. cities. Uh, in, in the U.S. we call those the gateway cities, and we might expect to see more neighborhood change uh, in the gateway cities, that's, a, that's uh, looking down here. Um, what about uh, places that are denser? Uh, um, so we're going to look at the uh, slope of the density gradient. We're going to also look at the intercept of the density gradient for each of those metropolitan areas as a way of trying to figure out whether neighborhood changes is more likely in places that uh, are, have denser cores or denser overall. Um, uh, so here's just some expectations. And lastly, we're interested in planning. Um, one of the, in America, we have a number of metropolitan areas, um, a few, not too many, uh, that have put uh, uh, urban containment programs uh, in place. Now, uh, here in London, the urban containment program is primarily the green belt. Uh, in, in America, we don't have many cities with green belts. In fact, we don't have any, but we have what are known as urban growth boundaries. So we draw a line somewhere in the metropolitan area, and intense urban growth is precluded from happening outside that gro growth boundary. It's, in, it's assumed to be redirected back inward. So we would expect that, um, that if those gr growth boundaries are working, that they would redirect investment from the fringe back into the cores, be associated with some level of upgrading. So that's why those two positive signs are there. Um, and lastly, uh, again, in the United States, um, before developers these days can develop uh, intense uh, apartments or uh, suburban homes, uh, they often have to meet infrastructure requirements. They have to put in their own infrastructure or pay for that infrastructure. Uh, to the extent that that infrastructure is not there, it's going to cost more money for suburban development than for urban development. The infrastructure tends to be in the urban areas. So we might expect the, the presence of an infrastructure capacity requirement to push development from the fringe areas back into the core. At least that's what I expect. What did I find? Not much, actually. Uh, the first thing to notice is these are, again, very simple, ordinarily squared regression models uh, where the uh, dependent variable is the share of the population uh, that's upgrading in blue, gentrifying in green, 
declining in red. Uh, and if you look at the R squared numbers, you can see they're not very high. The R squared for the core areas uh, upgrading is only 0.19 out of one. That's not very good. Uh, 0.19 for the gentrifying share, 0.44 for the declining share. So we've got these models, this idea that, that neighborhood change percolates from the regional level down, doesn't seem to apply very much for upgrading and gentrification. These models do a better job looking um, in terms of decline. Same thing for the suburban areas down in the bottom part. Um, the upgrading, uh, the R squared for the suburban upgrading, 0.28. Uh, gentrifying suburban areas get a little, do a little better, R squared 0.44, and finally the declining area is 0.31. Now let's look at what, that, now the, this, I ran a whole bunch of models I ran. I sort of, this, this, this analysis fell into what I call the first law of regression, which means that um, if you have uh, uh, n number of independent variables, sooner or later you will run n factorial models because that's simply the fact that you will forget the first model that you ran and run it again and again and again until you finally believe it uh, one way or another. Um, so I ran a lot of models, um, a lot of things. And so this is quite interesting. Um, uh, in terms of what regional factors or what metropolitan factors were associated with higher shares of core area upgrading, the presence of an urban containment line was the only factor. So at least in America, these urban containment boundaries do seem to be pushing some development from the fringe uh, back into the core areas. Um, uh, also, those containment lines were associated with higher levels of gentrification, not just upgrading, but gentrification as well. Um, the average percent of the census tracts that were white as opposed to non-white was negatively associated with gentrification, meaning the higher the share of white population on a census tract level, the lower um, the pressure for gentrification. So gentrification was happening primarily where there were more non-white uh, po population, particularly in 1990. In 1990. That was core area gentrification. Um, in terms of decline, this is quite interesting, um, and it's, uh, it mirrors some other research findings. In terms of core area decline, the leading positive factor was just population change, the rate of population change. And you can see that population change enters both the core area declining model and the suburban declining model. And that shows up as a lot of instability in the rate of population growth tends to promote instability in neighborhood outcomes as well. So where there are higher rates of population growth at the metropolitan scale, you saw higher shares of declining census tracts in both suburban and core areas. Um, density was inversely proportion, proportional in the core areas to decline. So the higher the CBD density, the more stable that neighborhood was. Uh, median income was also inversely proportional to decline. The higher the central city income or the core area income, the less likely it was to decline. Some of these findings aren't too surprising, but it's interesting that um, they're there. Turning to the suburban areas, again, not too surprising. Um, the, the higher the percentage of households with children, the more likely a neighborhood was to increase uh, in terms of both upgrading and gentrification. Uh, and, and gentrification in the suburbs is simply building a lot nicer housing, which a lot ni higher income people move into. We, we can't, often can't imagine how the suburbs would, um, would uh, gentrify, but think about uh, the, the, the residents of, of an older suburb, which uh, I constantly have. Do you folks do square feet here or square meters? I, I never, what's the preferred measure of area? Square meters? So I always have to convert on the fly. So think about a neighborhood in which the housing that was built uh, 40 years ago is 160 square meters, and now the housing in, in that neighborhood would be uh, 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 300 square meters. And think about, and so the type of population that's going to live in that different type of housing, so that's an example of suburban upgrading, sometimes called an mansionization. I don't know if there's a similar um, description here uh, in the UK. Um, in terms of suburban decline, this is actually quite interesting. Uh, the higher the percentage of foreign-born population, the less suburban decline. So in many of the suburbs, we have a lot of immigrant families moving into suburban areas. That's a good thing as a bulwark against decline. Uh, and again, there's an inverse relationship with the density of the CBD uh, and um, uh, suburban uh, gentrification. So a, a bunch of interesting findings here, but the, the general finding is um, when it comes to uh, core area upgrading, 
and uh, core area gentrification. It doesn't seem to be a regional phenomenon. It doesn't seem to be a metropolitan-wide phenomena. When it comes to decline, the connection between what's happening at the metropolitan area and what's happening at the local area seems to be uh, a, a little stronger. So there's a real asymmetry here between uh, the, the connection of the regional economy or regional demographic change uh, and neighborhood, gender, uh, neighborhood change. Uh, that's a weak relationship for upgrading and gentrification. It's a much stronger relationship um, for decline. Again, we've got 70 metropolitan areas. So if it's not happening top down, to what extent might it be happening bottom up? What about maybe gentrification neighborhood change is being driven by the characteristics of the residents? The degree to which, to which the residents are themselves aspirational, the degree to which uh, a neighborhood is targeted by developers or redevelopers for population change, the degree to which people who move into a neighborhood uh, like it a lot and they decide that they, and they tell their friends about it and they get a lot of their friends move in and things like that. So maybe this process of neighborhood change is really much more of a bottom-up phenomena uh, than a top-down phenomena. So we're going to ask the question, how much of this phenomenon is shaped by the actions of individual households, property owners, developers, uh, and speculators acting at the neighborhood level. And again, normally we would do a survey and ask these folks why they did what they did, but when you've got 70 metropolitan areas, and I think I had about 50,000 census tracts, so sort of a sample survey isn't going to do it. So again, we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at, uh, in this case, tract level information. Uh, again, about 50,000 census tracts we're looking at. We're looking at the characteristics of tracts in, in 1990 as predicting what would happen later, and here's just what we expect, here are our expectations about the relationships between some of these tract level characteristics um, and uh, um, either uh, upgrading uh, or decline. Uh, um, here's um, some interesting planning relationships between, well, what's the, what's the uh, relationship between uh, the distance of the tract to the center city? Uh, we're also interested in, in, in spatial clustering of, the, of these. Um, this phenomena. So we included the X and Y coordinate of the track to see if we could measure spatial clustering. Uh, and lastly, we were interested in some economic factors, including this idea of um, rent gap. Now, the rent gap idea was introduced by the geographer Neil Smith uh, in the 1970s as sort of a Marxist um, explanation for uh, um, uh, um, uh, gentrification or for neighborhood change. And, and Neil Smith's original definition of, uh, of rent gap has been very difficult to operationalize. It's really hard to figure out exactly what to measure. So I'm going to have a measure of rent gap. It's a little different than Smith's related, but a little different. But And uh, let me tell you about it in a second. As well as down here, we included the metropolitan area effect, the top-down effect um, on neighborhood change. Um, so, um, so I'm going to def oops. Well, let me just say that uh, uh, way back in uh, 1984, I don't know if Doonesbury is published. In, is it published in any, uh, in any uh, UK uh, journals? Well, way back in 1984, this guy Gary Trudeau was very prescient. He, uh, this is a very famous cartoon. Actually, this whole publication was, uh, um, uh, 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 this, this whole presentation is, appears in the most recent issue of Housing Policy Debate. So if you want to read more about all the statistics and numbers, you can look at the American Journal Housing Policy Debate. Uh, and in, in order to publish this, I had to actually go back and I had to speak to the, I had to uh, correspond with a publisher, the syndicate that publishes Doonesbury, and I had to request a reprint um, uh, 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 privilege to reprint this. And, but it turns out that this uh, uh, cartoon comes from 1984. So Gary Trudeau was writing about uh, uh, um, gentrification in 1984, and I really, really, really wanted to get this article published. I thought it was a good article. I was very proud of it. I probably would have paid $500 to get the reprint right for this. It was 10 bucks, so it was like the the best uh, the best bargain I ever got in my life to get this. So anyway, here is Dr. Dan is a is a sort of know-it-all character. Um, so here, Dr. Dan, this is a Mark Slackenmeyer interviewing. Uh, uh, Dr. Dan, if you read the if you read the comics today, uh, all of these characters have aged a little bit, not quite as much as I have, but they've uh, aged a little bit more since 1984. Dr. Dan, I wonder if you could explain to our listeners what gentrification means. He says, for sure, it works. People talked in a very hip way in the in 1980s. For sure, it works like this. A developer buys a dilapidated house in a depressed neighborhood. He fixes it up and resells it to a young middle. 
uh, class couple. This encourages other gentry to buy into the neighborhood, and before long, a fantastical, a fantastic real estate market booms where none existed before. And then the interviewer asked, and what happens to low-income tenants uh, who are displaced? Does anyone care? So there's a great question, and of course, Dr. Dan says, sure we do. We need these people to lower their property values in the first place. So the low-income families uh, uh, serve a very important function. It's to take high-valued real estate, lower the property values, enabling developers to um, pick it up for a swan song, uh, raise the value, and sell it at a much higher price. I think that's a wonderful explanation of this idea of the rent gap. And so we just operationalized that uh, idea. I didn't give Doonesbury any credit. Um, in this case, the rent gap is the difference between a, what a given dwelling unit or a set of similar dwelling units actually rents or sells for and what it should rent or sell for given its location and characteristics. So a positive rent gap indicates that a unit or neighborhood is overpriced. That is, the, the current market uh, price is more than one would expect given um, the distance to the CBD, other locational characteristics, and the characteristics of the housing stock. That is, the market is selling at a premium. That would call that a positive rent gap. A negative rent gap indicates a unit or neighborhood is underpriced. It sells at a discount and is thought to encourage speculation or gentrification. So in theory, um, developers and speculators won't go into neighborhoods with positive rent gap because that those, uh, those apartments are already renting at a premium or the, or the homes are selling at a premium. There's a lot less of an opportunity for those developers, speculators, to engage in the sort of behavior that Doonesbury was writing about. Instead, they'll purposely target neighborhoods in which apartments are underpriced or houses are underpriced relative to what they should be and then try and flip them and turn them over. Um, so for each of the metropolitan areas, uh, we regress the median census tract apartment rent, which we have from the census, against various measures of age, density, uh, de uh, neighborhood graphics to create a tract-based expected measure of rent and then subtracted that measure from the actual rent to try and calculate a rent gap. And that went into the regressions. And here are the results, okay? So here I'm gonna start, first talk about the core area. Again, these are the central areas. Uh, a, a, a triple positive means it's especially important positive result. A triple minus sign means it's an especially important um, negative result. So let's just focus on the bolded uh, triples. Um, so if we wanna understand, now this is a logit model. It's not a regression model. So what we're doing here is we're looking at the likelihood or the probability that a particular neighborhood uh, was upgraded, gentrified, or declined. So we're not, we're not measuring the magnitude, we're measuring this change in status. So did it go from, did it go, did it rise two or more deciles? That's upgrading. Did it rise two or more deciles from the 40% or from the fourth decile? That's gentrification. Did it rise two or more deciles, or did it fall two or more deciles? Uh, that's decline. Um, so overall, in this sample of about 40 to 50,000 census tracts, we observed 760 tracts that upgraded, 583 that gentrified, and 797 that declined. Those are in the core areas. And basically, if we're interested in upgrading, the, the neighborhoods that were upgraded in this period started out with higher rents. They started out with a better educated um, resident population, and they, start, and they st tended to start out more white. So these are the neighborhoods that experience gentrification. Um, it, however, um, even though the rents were higher, and it was better, uh, the, the residents were better educated, and they were more white, they weren't particularly richer. In, in fact, the higher the relative income, um, the less likely the neighborhood was uh, to be upgrading. So that rent gap idea is coming in there. Even though the rent gap itself didn't, that idea that gentrification happens where people are upwardly aspirational but don't necessarily have a lot of money, that's, that seems to be the case for upgrading. And you see it for gentrification as well. A higher rent level, the high rent level signals to developers and speculators there's a possibility of the people will pay to live here. Um, higher percentage white that you're buying into a neighborhood where um, uh, you know the socioeconomics of the neighborhood and a low relative income. And what about neighborhood decline? Well, here, starting out from a high neighborhood income, being closer uh, to the uh, central business district was more associated with, was associated with decline, uh, and then particular characteristics of the housing stock. And interestingly, 
uh, although I don't ha exactly have uh, an explanation for it, your location east-west in the metropolitan area didn't seem to matter. Um, so the relative x-coordinate didn't matter, but your location north to south did seem to matter. So in this case, uh, the higher the y-coordinate, which means the more northern you were, the lower the likelihood of decline. So, um, in, in, uh, so the more northern core area tracts were less likely to decline, the more southern uh, were uh, um, more likely to decline. Actually, that's contrary to what we usually think about the geography is of cities uh, in America, because in America, uh, the winds usually blow, in most places, they blow west to east. Um, and so most of the poor areas are in the east because they pick up the pollutants and things like that from the city and carry them east. So we usually think about neighborhood prosperity and changes being an east-west phenomena. That actually didn't show up here. It showed up as a north-south phenomena. Here's the same, um, here's the same uh, um, results for uh, uh, for the suburban tracks again. Uh, start if you want the probability of uh, uh, upgrading. If you start out with a high value, and again, if your neighborhood is mostly white, you have a higher probability of upgrading. Uh, and, but if you're not at the top level of the income um, spectrum, that's this relative household income. Um, if you're closer to the bottom, you have a higher potential of upgrading. Um, uh, and gentrification is still the same thing. Uh, and uh, uh, what about suburban decline? Again, if you start out with a higher income, a higher rent, uh, and more multifamily units, this is this relative multifamily dwelling units, more apartments, you're more likely to decline. Uh, and if you start out with a, um, uh, a lower median home value, uh, you are uh, less likely uh, to decline. Um, okay, uh, uh, as, as in the metropolitan area models, um, the way we measure goodness, okay, all right. Let me see if I can get back to that previous one. Okay, um, the way we measure um, uh, uh, goodness of fit using logit models, there are many, many ways to do it. It's, it's not a particularly easy way to interpret it. The easiest way is to say, how good was the model at predicting what actually happened? So in the case of the, um, let's see if we can get to the previous one. Yeah, the core areas. Uh, this model only predicted 12% of the actual changes. This model did even worse, only 3%. This model, the decline model, did much better with 41%. Similar magnitudes for the suburban areas, 11%, about 5%, and then 30%. So the statistics, the ability to incorporate these things, do a much better job explaining decline, whether it's at the top-down metropolitan level or to the bottom-up track level. Um, the, the, it's much easier to, to anticipate and explain decline um, than it is to explain uh, um, upgrading and, and gentrification. Gentrification remains and upgrading remains, uh, even when we, whether we look at it from the top down level or the bottom up, it remains much more of an ad hoc phenomena. Um, and let me come to that when I talk about policy conclusions. Last question, to what extent are gentrification other forms of neighborhood change always accompanied by the displacement of existing residents? Now. Um, Every 10 years, uh, the Census Bureau in America uh, asks a whole bunch of questions uh, to the population. It's just not going to do it. Uh, asks a whole bunch of questions to the population, uh, including, uh, did you move in the last year? Okay. So uh, the Census Bureau gets a pretty good estimate of the proportion of people who moved in the last year. And we call those the one-year turnover rates. And this graphic just shows you the metro areas with the top turnover rates. These are one-year turnover rates as recorded in the 2010 census. They're not multi-year turnover rates, they're one-year turnover rates, but they're pretty stable. When we look year on, year, on, year off, um, these uh, turnover rates are pretty stable year to year. Uh, I, I purposely didn't look at uh, 2008, 2009 because of the recession, because of the financial crisis. 2010 was starting the recovery. Uh, it's still lower than we would expect. Um, but this is the average turnover rate across all the census tracts in the metropolitan area. And basically, in 2010, basically if you lived in Colorado Springs, which is a little south of Denver, Austin, uh, which is the only interesting city in Texas. So anybody here from Texas to take exception with that? Okay, well, I'll, I'll go on record and say Austin really is the only interesting city in Texas. Um, Las Vegas, uh, New Orleans, uh, these, these are the places that ha in which uh, uh, average uh, annual turnover rates, one-year turnover rates, averaged across the entire metropolitan area above 20%. Uh, 
And then you can see the places that were much more stable. Uh, Newark, where the average annual turnover rate was 11%, only one out of every 10 people moved in last year. On average, Seattle, 12%. That's a funny result for Seattle. We expect it to be much more dynamic. Um, Buffalo, 14%. Chicago, 14%. And then you can see the number of tracks uh, that tell us what the average turnover rate. So, so simply took these uh, average turnover rates, again, one-year turnover rates in 2010, and compared them to uh, did the tract for which they uh, did the uh, did the tract that ex did the turnover rate for that tract because again we can measure turnover rates tract by tract by tract was the hot were the higher turnover rates associated with the fact that a, a tract had been upgraded gentrified or declined okay now if gentrification is pushing people out okay then we would expect to see a positive relationship between a tract having gentrified and a higher rate of turnover in that tract. Okay? So here are the results. The first column says that, in fact, there were slightly higher rates of turnover uh, in the declining tract. It was statistically significant, okay? and higher rates of turnover in the declining tracts, and slightly lower rates in the upgrading tracks. The, the, uh, so I didn't look at gentrification, I looked at upgrading. So the rates of turnover are actually slightly lower in the upgrading tracks. Again, these are rates of turnover, they're not rates of displacement. Okay? Turnover includes voluntary and involuntary moving, voluntary and involuntary, and displacement is generally thought of as only involuntary. So turnover is the people who want to move, Displacement is the people who are pushed into moving. But they're generally pretty similar. Okay? Different people, different characteristics, but the rates are pretty, are, are pretty closely associated with each other. Um, here we're just looking at turnover. So again, decline seems to be promoting turnover, which is expected. Okay? Again, if you've lost your house, you probably have to move. If, if your neighborhood is losing value, you probably want to move. Um, and, but upgrading, if a neighborhood, so, so actually the rates of turnover were slightly lower uh, in um, the neighborhoods that were upgrading, but it was only marginally significant. And then if we look at the characteristics of the neighborhood and not, the, I'm sorry, the characteristics of the residents of the neighborhood, the income levels in the, in the, in the neighborhood, um, the age in, in, in the neighborhood, P higher income people move much less frequently than lower income people. No surprise to most of the people in this room, younger people move much more frequently than older people. If you're over 50, you're probably never going to move. Um, maybe you will. Maybe, maybe you have one or two more moves in, in you. Um, if you're a renter, you're going to move more frequently. Uh, if you're unemployed, you're probably going to move more frequently. So um, we know that the characteristics of the people affect um, migration and movement rates. Uh, and that's across the city as well as between cities. Uh, and when we enter the characteristics of the people, a, we get a much better fit to the model and the effects, the neighborhood effects, upgrading or decline, um, uh, uh, disappear. They're no longer significant. Uh, so what that tells us, again, we're, me we're measuring turnover, not measuring displacement. You can't measure displacement. There's no question on any of the census forms that says, what were the characteristics under which you moved? We're measuring turnover alone. But when you measure turnover, um, you see that the characteristics, um, as would be as a sociologist, would predict the, the determinants of turnover uh, happen at the individual or the family level. They don't pr predominantly happen um, uh, at the neighborhood level. Uh, so let me just sum up and see, answer my question, ask, answer my four questions, uh, and uh, see what the policy implications, and then take your questions. Uh, is it possible to come up with a robust approach to measuring gentrification and other types and neighborhood socioeconomic change across all U U.S. metropolitan areas. Well, I did this decile method, and it turns out to be pretty robust. But when I explain it to people, they say, well, mine, and I look, show the maps to people, they say, well, my neighborhood is, is gentrifying, but it's not showing up on your map. Something must be wrong with your map. And uh, um, well, I think my map's pretty good, but I, I think people ex on a personal level experience change in a very different way um, than uh, the statistics tend to bear it out. Uh, and anytime they see a whole bunch of new people who are in the neighborhood who are usually younger than them and apparently wealthier than them uh, and can afford higher priced meals than them. Uh, but that, and by the way, you know, change in restaurants happens to be very strongly associated with neighborhood change. Uh, 
Um, anytime people see that, they say, well, I'm, I, the neighborhood is experiencing gentrification. Uh, even though it, it, the, the people may not all, be all that different because the same people who weren't eating out before are not eating out now. The, same, the people who are you know, coming home at seven o'clock and not on the streets are still coming home at seven o'clock. So it's actually, so the signals that people draw about how a neighborhood is changing are not quite as the same as the statistical measures. And the statistical measures seem to be pretty robust, but they're not particularly resonant with how people experience neighborhood change. Um, to what extent uh, degree or gentrification, other forms of substantial neighborhood socioeconomic change, the result of metropolitan scale economic and demographic forces? Well, we can point to some places in which they are. New York City, San Francisco, Seattle, Las Vegas on the decline side. But when we get past this top five or six metropolitan areas, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it doesn't seem to be the result of what's happening at, at, a, at a regional or metropolitan scale. And the way I would put it is urban upgrading is happening everywhere, it's just more visible in the international media cities. So those, that Columbia, South Carolina, that Greensboro, North Carolina that made it onto my lists, uh, nobody, I don't think anybody's writing about that. Um, to what degree are gentrification other forms of substantial neighborhood socioeconomic change shaped by the actions of individual households, property owners, developers, and spectators operating at the neighborhood level. Uh, this is very much the case, uh, but it's not easy to model. It's not that, that neighborhood speculator, that neighborhood entrepreneur, that neighborhood set of families that are gradually changing family, uh, changing neighborhood, they really don't show up in, in, at the census tract. And so we can see some hints that that's really the driving factor, the driving force, but it's not, to the level where we can predict it. Uh, and lastly, to what extent are gentrification, other forms of substantial neighborhood change, always accompanied by displacement uh, of existing residents? And here I would say, in, if you say always accompanied, I would say much less than is commonly reported uh, by the media, which isn't to say that the existing residents won't have to pay more for their rent, won't have to pay more for their um, housing costs, won't have to pay more to eat out, but will they move as a result? Not so much. Um, okay, so policy guidance. Uh, so if you're a central city, city planner seeking to promote neighborhood upgrading, you might want to say, well, we don't want to promote, we have too much of it, we don't want to promote anymore. Well, there are many places, certainly in the United States, and I imagine there's still some here in the UK where a little upgrading would be on um, order. Um, so uh, if, reading into the, the results, uh, if you're interested in promoting upgrading in the core areas, focus on older, walkable neighborhoods having a diverse and aspirational population. A young population that's well-educated uh, in a higher density neighborhoods that has an older quality housing stock, that's the places where upgrading has occurred. Um, this idea suggests that instead of trying to limit upgrading as a means of deterring gentrification, again, I don't know what's happening here in London, but in the US, many planners are now saying, maybe we should try and limit, invest, limit investment in neighborhoods limit housing and commercial investment in neighborhoods because if it's going to be accompanied by gentrification, we don't want that, okay? I would probably think that amounts to throwing the baby out with the bathwater. But if that's happening, if you're interested in, in um, if, if you're interested in trying to control gentrification, I think local planners are probably better off trying to admit that some level of upgrading is going to occur. It's probably beneficial and simply try and more fairly distribute the benefits associated with those investments and with that upgrading. And there are many ways to do that. For example, uh, you can uh, put what, uh, happen, what people in America call circuit breakers in the property taxes. So that if your property tax rises a lot on a very short basis, you're protected against that. You're protected against rapidly rising um, property taxes and rapidly, rapidly rising property values. A lot of older residents report that to be a, a problem. By directing housing vouchers toward law, long time low income renters. Now I mentioned in America we only give uh, uh, housing assistance to about a third of the people who are eligible to the, uh, for it, but uh, vouchers do come available and when those vouchers come available, how about directing them to the low income residents who are likely to be the victims of displacement and gentrification? Uh, or, and this is many, metropo many cities in America are talking about this, uh, by imposing sizable transfer taxes 
on short-term property flippers and speculators. So um, in America, a transfer tax is a tax issued on the transfer sale of property. It, it generally averages between one to 2%. That revenue goes to the city. It goes into the city's coffers. How about making it a higher rent, higher transfer tax if you uh, flip the property, that is you uh, uh, upgrade it and, and do it that for less than uh, 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 one year or perhaps two years. How about putting a tax on speculation? A number of cities are talking, talking about that. And instead of having the revenues go to the city budget, have them go to the help, help the households who are likely to be displaced, whom we can pretty well identify. Um, center city planners seeking to anticipate and stem decline. Again, we've still got a lot of decline going on in American cities. Uh, should keep a close eye on more distant neighborhoods, those with proportionally more multifamily housing, those are the neighborhoods at risk, and those with large populations already in poverty. Um, and they should be aware that while decline is spatially contagious, that is if you, you're living in a neighborhood next to a neighborhood that has declined, you are more likely to decline. There's a large literature on this. Decline in American cities is spatially declined. Uh, contagious, but nothing in this work or anybody else's work shows that upgrading is spatially contagious. That is, there's not doesn't seem upgrading doesn't seem to happen as a buffering or a neighboring phenomena, but decline does. Um, in terms of anticipating and heading off decline, suburban planners should focus their efforts on racially diverse neighborhoods and neighborhoods with higher proportions of multifamily homes. Those are the neighborhoods in the suburbs of America um, that are uh, more likely. To decline. So um, I recognize that I'm talking about a phenomena, neighborhood change that occurs differently in different cities, different, different metropolitan areas, different countries. Um, this is a statistical analysis of 70 metropolitan areas in the United States. I'd be very interested to, to find out what's happening uh, in London, in the UK, and in some of the cities that you're familiar with, and whether some of these re results might um, hold. Now again, if I were speaking in the United States, I'd be very conscious that I'm keeping you from your football game, uh, but uh, here in the UK, football means something completely different, and I, I can't imagine, we call it soccer in America, I can't imagine there are any soccer games on tonight, otherwise you'd all be looking at your cell phones. Thank you again. There are glasses of wine waiting, so I will limit the, uh, the discussion. So, has anybody got any... Uh, Initial uh, questions for John based on that voice uh, I had to say. It's Matthew. So I'm really fascinated. Um, you mentioned on a number of occasions the, the fact that your data just happened to coincide with the crisis. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if you ran the analysis again now, what is going It's a great question. It's a great question, Matthew. Uh, I would expect, um, I think exactly what you would expect. I would expect to have seen gentrification pick up. I mean, some of these press accounts have to be right, okay? Uh, I would expect to see it have picked up, again, particularly in places like San Francisco uh, and, uh, um, and uh, New York City and Seattle and Los Angeles and Chicago. In Los Angeles and Chicago relate to the party, but we see evidence that they, that, uh, neighborhood upgrading is happening in those places. Uh, I would expect to see not so much in some of the places that are still experiencing um, problems. Uh, and I would expect to see, um, I would still expect to see uh, some level of suburban decline dominating because those neighborhoods that a lot of people um, were foreclosed out of. Uh, so in, in America, I don't know if it's the same here, uh, starting in about 1998, a lot of people moved into suburban communities basically speculating. They moved in and bought a much higher priced house than they could possibly afford on the assumption that its price would increase even more. Uh, when prices fell, they were trapped by their mortgages and there were huge foreclosures. Most of the foreclosures in America were actually in the suburban areas. Uh, prices have fallen in those neighborhoods. Uh, many of those neighborhoods are now relative bargains, and the people buying those neighborhoods are not speculating. So I would expect to see that the decline phenomenon hasn't changed very much, but I would expect to see more upgrading. I just I noticed that one of your um, one of your uh, cities, um, which had was it was in the upgrading core yeah. and in the gentrifying core, stopped in California. <laughs> Hard to believe. 
Yeah, I, I've been to Stockton, California, and, and if any of you have the opportunity to move to Stockton, California, none of you want to. Um, <laughs> having lived in California for most of my life, that's, a, that's, a, that's very, very strange. Um, I, uh, what, what's going on is that I think it's actu actually accurate, okay? Um, Stockton was uh, uh, one of those uh, metropolitan areas in the Central Valley of California, stems from Sacramento uh, down to uh, what's called Riverside, San Bernardino, it's known as the Inland Empire. Uh, and these were neighborhoods that lost tremendous value during the financial crisis. So basically the whole, na the whole metropolitan area um, uh, demographic has moved downward during this period. It's about, it's, it's a little scary. It's about, it's about 10 million people that saw a huge loss of wealth. I mean, they saw, they were, that was the group that was speculating on their houses starting about 1998. And so I, I think what's showing up there uh, is that you saw a, a number of neighborhoods in places like Stockton, Bakersfield was also on that list, that actually retained their values and retained their neighborhoods, their neighborhood character, retain, retained uh, their uh, neighborhood income. So while all the other neighborhoods around them were really downward, they were actually staying okay. I think that's what's happening in, in places like Stockton and Bakersfield. So relative to their metropolitan areas, which is the way we're counting this, they were upgraded. Okay. Stockton okay. Well, I, I, look, I, I'm sure it's, it's uh, it, 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 as true in the UK as it is uh, in America that uh, the uh, 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 fiscal prowess of the city government may or may not have any relationship to uh, other factors. I think that uh, particularly the, uh, the people in Stockton were particularly bad fiscal managers, as it turns out. Um, hi, thanks for your talk. Um, I'm, I may play devil's advocate here, and I'm going to reflect on the very bitter, bitter controversies there are in the UK between gentrification scholars on how we should stick to a very classical um, definition of gentrification, which includes the three elements you right. quoted at the beginning. Uh, changing income structure, changing property structures, and um, displacement. And so um, a lot of what you have showed us when talking about gentrification, as you said, was just a more extreme form of upgrading. But your data, because of the way the census is made, does not show us whether it's social mobility of the in-situ population that becomes richer in this particular neighborhood, or if, in the case That's of correct. a declining one, the population becomes poorer. We know that in, in these 20 years, income inequality has risen in the United States, just like here. And in London, Chris Hamnett has spent a lot of time trying to distinguish between these two processes. And he argued that in many cases where we thought this was gentrification, this was actually what he called professionalization. So I'm sure you've been thinking about it a lot. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask to what extent you can sort of deal with this bias, which is that your data clearly shows upgrading. But it's very hard, I think, to infer from that whether it's actually gentrification in the classical That's right. sense. So the question is, is the existing population just get a lot wealthier, okay, uh, which would show up as upgrading, uh, much wealthier than the metropolitan uh, population, uh, and that would show up as upgrading and gentrification, or do we actually have a wealthier population moving in and proportionally displacing the older, poorer population? Not, if not physically displacing, then just basically a wealthier population uh, moving in. Um, you know, there, there has not, uh, the census data in America does not allow us to, to figure that out. Uh, we can look at, we can use census data to, to, to analyze that question, but we can't do it at the neighborhood level. We can do it at the city level where we actually have the actual micro data, the actual individual um, uh, people, but we can't do that at the neighborhood level for confidentiality reasons. I don't know if those reasons apply uh, in the UK, but in America we're unable to look at who moves in, who moves out at the neighborhood level, which is a big problem. And, I, and, and so uh, a bunch of other people to get around that problem have actually done surveys, they've actually used non-census data uh, uh, to uh, um, uh, try and address the problem. And again, in the, in the places where the media is covering gentrification, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, New York, it does seem to be more of the latter explanation, the explanation you're talking about happening here uh, in the UK, uh, where um, a, a new population is moving out, in, moving in, and is either proportionally or in absolute terms displacing um, the older population. However, even where that is happening, even where you're getting a change in the people, not just people are getting better off, even where you're getting a change in the people, all those studies show that except for low-income renters, 
except for low-income renters, which in the United States has a very specific definition, people are not being displaced. Okay, so the displacement problem, to the extent that it's happening in the United States, either because of a general upgrading or because of a change in the composition of the neighborhood, uh, seems to be almost entirely limited. Again, displacement as involuntary turnover seems to be entirely limited to low-income renters, which means from a policy perspective, we can do something about it. Okay, we can help those people, uh, assuming they have some sort of uh, claim on their neighborhood, um, um, we can keep those neighborhoods economically diverse if we decide to do so. so. Yes? Um, do you think that I was interested that you um, looked at your double decile change mm -hmm. with, within a metropolitan area, so relative to its own metropolitan right. area. Do you think that decision hides some of the gentrification that we might otherwise see if you were comparing the deciles of each tract relative to the US population as a whole. Um, so, so in, I'm thinking of somewhere like San Francisco where yeah. prices have risen an awful yeah. lot relative to the rest of the country since 1990. Um. I, 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 you, know, you know, the U.S. is physically so much bigger than the U.K., and there's so many more metropolitan areas that I, I just can't see that method as being robust. Um, but I do, again, we, we can say pretty decisively that uh, in the Seattle's, in the San Francisco's, in the New York's, let, to a lesser extent in the Washington, D.C.'s, we have seen uh, real estate prices, particularly the price of home ownership, rise much faster than incomes. So even though these neighborhoods are gentrifying or upgrading in terms of incomes, the price of real estate has increased even faster. And in almost every case, that is due to the difficulty of new construction. But where we observe um, the price of either rent or real estate or ownership real estate rising faster than incomes, when incomes are rising, when incomes are rising, that's simply due to the inelastic nature of the supply which from a policy perspective is just the difficulties of building, and I think you observe that here as well. Thank you for your presentation, very interesting. My interest is um, in a way come at the end of your presentation where you start to talk about walkable neighborhood and somehow uh, giving a, a spatial characterization of the neighborhood that are of interest. And I wonder if your model is not suffering from some methodological issues that like uh, hedonic modeling, early hedonic modeling was uh, kind of suffering, which is like distance to CBD, uh, which is not very kind of like uh, sensitive to uh, the characteristic of the neighborhood in a way. For example, you don't explain, I mean, you have this kind of uh, very funny uh, finding, which is like the north-south discrimination. Uh, uh -huh. So is there not in your model somehow some other methodological kind of issue which are more spatial I, you know, I, I have run these things on a more limited basis, looking for spatial autocorrelation. Mm -hmm. um, and I've, again, on the decline side, over a 20 year period, we found very strong incidences of spatial autocorrelation, which leads you know, my, to my conclusion that the decline is clearly you know, spatially contagious. We did see um, spatial autocorrelation occurring. Um, we didn't see it um, on the upgrading side um, to the extent that you have one neighborhood um, and if there was spatial autocorrelation, you'd say, okay, that one neighborhood upgraded first or gentrified first, the neighborhoods around it should have seen a kick. Um, and we haven't observed, we don't observe that in the data um, and we don't observe that actually in reality um, as well. If you go to sort of the place in New York that's sort of, a place in the U.S. that's sort of gentrification capital, which is Brooklyn. Okay. What we do see are see, we see the disparate neighborhoods um, being upgraded and, and gentrified. Again, uh, it usually has, more, to the extent that it can be predicted, it usually has more to do with the initial socioeconomic and sociodemographic characteristics of the neighborhood than purely its location and space. So, but that's anecdotal based on the most studied city in America on this, Brooklyn. Uh, questions? Um, well, there is an opportunity to discuss this uh, further with John if we retire now for a, a glass of wine. And as I said, we, um, this is available in G01 of Central House, which most of you will know where that is, but those of, those of you who don't, it's another woman place, which is less than five minutes' walk from here. If you follow the 
to other people. I'm sure they'll, they'll lead you to the to the one. Um, so can I can I end by um, thank you, John, very much for, for the presentation. Thank you for your questions. Um, it's been a great pleasure to have you here, John. Um, can we uh, thank John again in the traditional way? Thank you.